Hello everyone, I would like to share some of the new features coming to Sci4. To illustrate what we're doing, I'm going to use a Jupyter Notebook, as this is right here, uh, where we can run Python interactively, and more importantly, Sci4 interactively. As of the Sci4 1.1 update, you'll be able to import Sci4 into any Python script or Jupyter Notebook. In addition, I'm going to import SciMagic, which is going to contain a lot of functions that will be available in Sci4 in the future. So now we can create a new molecule by saying sci4.molecule uh, with some kind of XYZ string. This can, of course, be any kind of Z matrix or Cartesian input that you'd normally find in the molecule mole bracket syntax. In addition, with this poor Python input, I'm able to run help on all these objects so I can get all of the attributes and functions associated with this class and all the details on being able to use and access them right here in my Python notebook. In addition, I'm able to start uh, very easy ways of looking at molecules and visualizing molecules uh, within this notebook. And so this is a fairly straightforward uh, OpenGL uh, molecule viewer where I can turn, turn it, twist it, uh, zoom in and out, etc. As you can see, we are not quite ready to release this particular feature. In addition, I can compute any sort of very standard uh, energy optimization gradient call right from here. Uh, where in this case I'm asking for the STF, STO3G uh, energy. In addition to being able to run this on my laptop, what I'd really like to be able to do is run this on a server somewhere. So on my server, we're using DAS Distributed, and I booted up a scheduler. And what I can do is I can then connect to the scheduler in the very classical uh, host client model, where I will send it different pieces of data to compute, and it will return the answer to me. So for example, if I say scimagic.energy, instead of running on my laptop now, it'll use the scheduler where it ships uh, this little piece of data off to the server, computes it, and then returns the energy to me when it is complete. So to really illustrate this kind of technology, what we're going to do is we're going to run a potential energy scan. And what we have here is an XYZ, or I'm sorry, a Z matrix uh, input of the benzene methane dimer where the distance between the two monomers is defined by this distance d. So I'm going to use python string find replace and then call sci4 geometry on this to build a new molecule that I can view. And I can indeed see that this is the benzene methane dimer. Then what I can do is I can loop over quite a few different distances, uh, do the same string find replace to build molecules of different separation and request the energy to be run on the server. In this case, I want the B3LOP D3N method STO3G basis set with the BSSC type of counterpoise corrected. So I'm going to go ahead and let this run. And one of the unique features of using Dask is that I'm actually able to visualize what my server is doing and what it's running. So the first thing to note is when I ask it to compute this information, I have some kind of uh, network send receive spike where I ship this data out. And then immediately after that, I can see that I have started actually computing uh, everything that I requested. And since these are fairly small computations, I'm not actually uh, taking up a very large part of my server. And so how this works is every single object is going to return to me a future. And so what this is, is this is data on the server, and it's a single computation. And this computation has not completed yet because the task is still pending. So I can keep asking, when is this done? And I can actually see that it's now finished. And I can also look at the result of this computation. Uh, so I'm returning all the data that's all the data from the server to my local client. As you can see, what this is is this is effectively a serialized run of Sci4, where I have the molecule data, and also all of the single variables that Sci4 creates. So for example, uh, what is the SCF total energy right here? Uh, what is my current dipole for my x, y, and z. So there's going to be no more scraping outputs uh, or text-based outputs using this kind of format. Everything is returned in very simple JSON where we can start communicating with our quantum chemistry packages at a much deeper layer. So what I can do is I can loop over all these features, ask for the result, and I want the current energy or the counterpoise correct energy that I requested, multiply it by 627.5 to convert the cake out to mole from Hartree. And then what I can use is I can use Seaborn, which is a very popular Python-based plotting program to actually return myself a potential energy curve 
as shown right here. In addition, I'm very interested in databases. So another thing we can do is we can load up a SciMagic database, which at its core is a um, pandas data frame. And I've stored this in a very complex, um, in a very uh, compressed format. And so I can load it in and I can look at the shape. So I have 8,000 rows and about 100 columns, so a little less than a million data points. And the data subsets uh, range from the very small A24 test set for non trivial interactions um, to the very popular S22 by 7 uh, data set that's uh, uh, first popularized by Hobza et al. Um, to really show off what kind of different non trivial interactions that we have. And I can see that all of these results are going to be uh, some kind of DOT method with um, an empirical dispersion term uh, in several different basis sets. <clears throat> So the first thing that I can do is I can use list comprehension to filter out a couple of these columns. So for example, I only want the B through lip data in the QZPP basis set. And then if I just simply ask, what is the mean unsigned error for these columns? I can get it right here. So for example, what if I just want the subset of S66 by 10? I can look at this error. If I want the mean unsigned relative error, I can simply add a simple a single letter and then finally, if I want to, I can plot this with kind equals bar. Um, so very simple way and very easy way to get very intuitive information out of this. In addition, we can do quantum chemistry specific uh, figures. In this case, this is going to be a ternary plot. And so what this is, is the breakdown between all intermolecular forces as determined by SAP's theory. So for example, um, any kind of strongly dispersion bound system is going to occupy this space, um, strongly electrostatically bound this space, and then finally any kind of electrostatically repulsive up here. So you can see I get a nice big, um, nice, a very nice coverage of this graph um, with all these data sets together. And again, I can look at different subsets. So for example, SSI is going to be a protein based side chain, side chain interaction data set. Um, so we've got about 3,000 points, cover this dispersion region very strongly, um, and either some of the electrostatic as well. But what happens if I look at a data set where I don't have data for? And I say, oh no, um, I need this data somehow. Uh, so what I can do is I can ask my database to go off and compute uh, SAP0 and the A24 subset. So I can do this, and again, I can go back to my application, and I can see that these computations are very, very cheap, and they're running very quickly on my server. And what's really nice about this is as this data comes back, it says my background queue is completed, it automatically updates my data frame here. And because the backbone to this data frame is a Mongo database, all my data is always saved. So as soon as the computation is complete, it comes back, saves it to disk. Uh, so very strong way of doing this. In addition, what happens if I accidentally run this twice? It tells me that there's nothing new to compute because I already have all my A24 data points. And finally, we can do more expressive graphs. For example, this is going to be a violin plot where I have uh, basically the kernel density estimator for all the different points um, in a unsigned relative error uh, metric. And what I can see from this, for example, is that for BVI, which is going to be backbone backbone protein interactions, um, both before and after refitting. Uh, so before refitting, I had this kind of strange population at between 40 and 60 percent error. Um, after my refitting, I can see that I have completely removed this kind of odd singularity and pushed all my errors down to about 10 to 20 percent. So in addition to being able to run all kinds of computations in a database, we're actually able to think of ways to visualize these to tell us much more about how these things are distributed than just simply the relative error. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the video.